Uh, my husband, Pastor Andrew, he's actually the chef at home. It's not me, all right? I do the floor, I do the laundry, but he does all the cooking because uh, he does it better than me, so he's got that duty. So he will cook every year for Chinese New Year. And, you know, family, friends would come, and he would cook this dish. Uh, it's a Teochew-style Chinese soup. Okay, in Teochew, it's called the Pe Cai Teng. Ah, all the Teochew, ah, around here. But I call it the awesome soup, lah, huh? because I'm Hakka, right? So, 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 so this is the awesome soup uh, that he cooked this Chinese New Year. And he laboriously prepares, he re- laboriously prepares it uh, from the recipe from his mother. All right, his mother passed down to him. And he would prepare it a few days before the actual day of eating it. Because he had to boil the soup for many days in order to bring out the rich flavour. Okay, then he adds the abalone, the fish maw, the fish ball, the mushroom, the meatball with a crunchy water, crash, uh, water chestnut, and other delicious ingredients. Are, are you kind of salivating? Okay. Okay, most people <laughs> would go for seconds, if not thirds. Oh, let's take a look at, let's take a look at that picture. Yep. So yeah, this was all the dishes that we had on the first day, the second day of Chinese New Year. Okay, that's another Teochew dish and another one. Okay, there's a special rice and fried eggs uh, with pork inside. Of course, the bakwa is there as well. So on the second day of Chinese New Year, the pastors came to our place for lunch. And the soup really pleased them. Let's take a look. Okay, this is the second day of Chinese New Year. All the pastors uh, were there at my home and, and, and uh, they were eating this. And they really enjoyed the soup. In fact, they would tell me, oh, this year is your husband cooking the special soup. I said, yes, and that is the attraction for them to come uh, to our home. It was a delectable feast and they look forward every year to coming uh, to eat this dish. So for us, we know what pleases the pastors, right? Uh, to cook this special Pei Cai Teng. But the question to ask is today, do we know what pleases God? Do we know what pleases God? Stephen J. Lawson said this, If you please God, it does not matter whom you displease. Alright, it's in the PowerPoint. And if you displease Him, it does not matter whom you please. Can we have that on the PowerPoint? Yeah, that's right. Okay, if you please God, it does not matter whom you displease. Am I correct? And if you displease him, it does not matter whom you please. So today I'm going to preach about what pleases God. And you know, this is part of the preaching series on knowing God reaching man, which is the theme of our church. So if you want to know God, you need to know what pleases God. Amen? So you do what pleases God. Amen? Come no, no amen this morning. Amen? Yeah, that's important. And there are different things in the Bible that mentions that pleases God. There are different, different things. But today, I want to talk about one thing. There, there is one thing that stands out from among them, and that is faith. Faith pleases God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to commit this service to you. I ask Holy Spirit that you take over right now. I ask Holy Spirit that you speak to every heart. I ask Holy Spirit that you will be that voice that will speak to every heart even as the preacher preaches. Anoint the preacher today, Lord, to bring forth your word in a powerful way that will bring transformation because your word is transforming. So Lord, I pray as the word goes forth from my lips this morning, it will transform lives through the conviction of the Holy Spirit that is happening right now. We give you full reign, Holy Spirit, in this place. I pray, Lord, it will bear fruit 60, 100, 30 folds, 60 and 100 folds. Be with us, O oh Lord. We bind every form of distraction in Jesus' name and that, Lord, your word go forth unhindered. Amen. Amen. Let's go. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says this, And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. You see, friends, when we put our faith in God, when we believe in Him, He is pleased with that. It's as simple as that. Do you know that? If you believe in God 
He is pleased. Jesus says that our work is to believe in the one whom God has sent. In other words, our work is to believe in Jesus. Let's take a look at John chapter 6, verse 29. It says this, Jesus told them, this is the only work, listen to this, only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. In other words, Jesus says, believe in me. That is your work. In fact, here is the only work. Faith or believe in Jesus is the most important thing in the life of a Christian. Do you know that? Faith. Faith is so important. We must put our faith in Jesus Christ. When we believe in Jesus, that's faith. And faith pleases God. So the question is, what is faith? So let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. So we're going to go through line by line. Okay, so today's Bible uh, preaching is from Hebrews chapter 11. So now, faith is confidence of what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. I mean, this is commonly quoted, but let's go a little bit deeper to understand what this verse means. The word confidence or hypothesis in Greek carries the meaning of standing under a guaranteed agreement like a title deed to a promised property. That is a legitimate claim entitling someone to what is guaranteed under the, uh, the particular agreement. So what's all that? Sounds like legal term. In other words, to simplify this, faith is having a confidence in God like that of having the title deed of a property you know the property is yours because you have the legal document in your hand. That's what it means. That is the kind of faith you need to have. It's a very, very confident faith. It's like the title is in your hand. What's the chances of you not owning the house? Zero. That is the kind of confidence God is talking about that you need to have. That is the kind of faith you need to have. As if that title deed is in your hand, that you have it already. It's yours. Amen? So that is faith. And the word assurance or elenchus in Greek means to argue convincingly to prove a point. You see, the ancient Greeks like to debate. I don't know if you watch TV or not. They like to go and debate, right? All the philosophers like to go and debate. Even in the book of Acts, they were debating about all the gods and all the philosophies of that day. In Ephesus, this was happening. And so they debate passionately over different subjects. And so the picture is this. In other words, you are so convinced about what you are arguing for that you debate convincingly even when you don't see it, you don't see the evidence yet. That's faith. That's faith. It's the kind of assured faith that you argue so passionately for it even though you don't see it with your eyes yet. Faith is something you do not see with your naked eye, but believe with great certainty in your heart that that is coming. That is called faith. That's what Hebrews 11, chapter, one, uh, chapter 11, verse, verse 1 is all about. The, a Bible scholar said this. Let's take a look. Just as our physical eyesight is the sense that gives us evidence of the material world, it means your eyes can see the material world. Faith is the sense that gives us evidence of the invisible spiritual world. That's what faith is. If you have the substance in front of you, before you, and if you can see it, there is no use for faith. If you can see it, there's no use for faith. Faith is needed for what we can't see and can't touch. Amen? I'm giving you many definitions so that you know what faith is. And it's important that you know what faith is because if you don't, you can't please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please, and please God. And God requires that kind of faith from us. Not a doubtful faith, but a sure faith and a sure faith in God. Amen. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Okay. So today... I want to talk about three types of faith that pleases God. You know there are different kinds of faith that pleases God? And today I think there's time for three, all right? So, are you ready? 
Well, three types are okay. The first type of faith that pleases God is faith that trusts God for your finances. Oh, this is an interesting one. To tell you the truth, I wanted to skip this verse because I was thinking, okay, let's go to verse 6, 7. You know, but the, as I was seeking God, God says, no, you just preach sequentially. You just preach from verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, and all the way because there is a purpose for it. And the first one is finances. Is the, let the word speak for itself. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. It's very interesting. The first person in the hall of faith, not hall of fame, chapter 11 is hall of faith, Okay, the first person in the hall of faith that pleased God was Abel. Because of what? Because of his giving. And because of his giving, he was noted as a righteous man according to Scripture. And God showed his approval of his gift. That's what the verse says. So God is pleased because of Abel's giving. Scripture says even though he has died, he still speaks to us by his example of what? Faith giving. Faith giving. And it's interesting that this is the very first thing God touched on. Isn't it interesting? On where he required faith. And that is in the area of giving. He didn't start with Abraham. That sacrificed his son. He started with Abel. The fourth person that was ever uh, on this earth. First was Adam, right? Second Eve. Third was the brother Cain and the second son Abel. Fourth person. They ever lived on earth. When the Bible talks about the first, the first person, right, Abel, in this hall of faith, we need to take note because it means it's very important. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, let's take a look. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's Jesus speaking. You see, giving is the way to show where our heart is in relationship to God. That's what this Bible verse is talking about. If you give to God's kingdom, your heart is naturally with God's kingdom. Am I correct? If you give to something else, your heart is naturally in that place, in that something else. That's what this Bible verse is saying. And so this verse talks about Abel's offering that was pleasing to God and Cain's offering that was not pleasing to God. So let's take a look at why God was pleased with Abel's giving and not Cain's giving. For this, we got to go back to Genesis. So let's take a look at this passage. Genesis chapter 4, verse 2 to 5. Let's, let's go. Later, she, who is Eve, right, the mother, gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. Verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits. Everyone say some. All right, that's the, that's the key here. Of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Verse 4. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Everyone say firstborn. Okay, that's important. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Uh, Robert Morris said it in this way. Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. In other words, you know, it's like a random plucking. He go to his garden and pluck something, pluck an apple, pluck a durian, whatever, from his orchard, and he gave it to the Lord. That, that's what it means. It's more like an afterthought or giving of spare change if you want to put it that way, to the Lord. So God wasn't pleased with that because he didn't give what was required of him. In contrast, Abel brought the fat portions of, from where? From the firstborn. This is a very important word. Firstborn of his flock. In other words, Abel gave his first fruits. That's what it means. The firstborn, the first fruit. And God said clearly, in the law of Moses, to give our first fruits to the Lord. Let's take a look at Exodus chapter 34, verse 19 and 20. 
The first offspring from every womb belongs to me. This is God saying. Every womb, firstborn. And all your male livestock. The first offspring from cattle and sheep. You shall redeem with a lamb the first offspring from a donkey. If you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. You shall redeem all the firstborn of your sons. Doesn't mean you kill the son, all right, your firstborn son, but you have to sacrifice a lamb. All right, to sacrifice to the Lord, to redeem your firstborn son. None shall appear before me empty handed. See, in the law of Moses, you can't consume the first lamb that was born, or you can't sell it. You can't sell it as, as a livestock. You must give it as an offering unto the Lord. This is called the first fruits. Likewise, when you give to the Lord, we don't just give any offering. Just don't pluck here, pluck there, whatever, you know, or give uh, whatever you think. But we must give our first fruits to Him. In modern days term, what does it mean? Because we don't keep flock, right? We don't really plant any orchard. What does it mean in our day term? It means when we receive our paycheck, our salary, right? The first person we give to is... <laughs> Two of you are coming. God! God is the first person you give to because that's your first fruit. You get it? You first give to Him before you give to anything else. And for my husband and I, you know, once we receive our, our salary, the first thing we do, because now it's all E, right? So we just give E back to the church. Whatever the church pays us, we, we, pay, we give our tithe, all right? We return our tithe to the Lord. And God is the first person we give to. We don't give it in the middle of the month. We don't give it at the end of the month. We give it on the day we get paid, before we pay any other bills or give to anyone else, we give unto the Lord. Because that honours God. That honours God. And when we do that, God is pleased. Because why? It means we trust Him with our finances. That's what it means when you tithe and when you return it and give it first to the Lord. It means that we trust God that whatever is left over, which is the 90%, God will cause it to multiply and cause it to be enough for us with left over. Can somebody say amen? Yeah, it's faith. It's faith giving to trust God for your expenses for that month or, or that whatever it is, you know, the time, uh, that, that month, okay, how, how, whenever you are paid, that you, you trust God, that God will have more than enough for you. Amen. How many Christians fail to please God because they fail to trust Him for their finances? They don't tithe, they don't return that which rightfully belongs to God because they can't believe that God will supply. That's the issue. They can't believe that God will supply to them the more than enough with what remains. And by the way, in Malachi chapter 3, God calls that robbing him if we don't return our tithe. The opposite of faith is fear. Fear. Many Christians have the fear of lack. It's a fear, of, it's like a fear that grips the believer. They can't believe that God will supply their need. They, can't, they worry about their future. They worry about their old age. They worry that if they tithe or they give to the Lord, they won't have enough to pay their bills. And this is from the pit of hell. It comes from Satan that comes into their mind that, you know, if you give to God, you won't have enough. I won't ask for a show of hands how many of you uh, hear, hear that from Satan. But it is a true thing. And we need to break that today in Jesus' name. Amen. We need to break the fear of lack. We need to break that fear uh, that, that, that there won't be enough today in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen? We need to break that. Because here's a promise for you. Let's take a look. Chapter, uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 to 10. This is a promise of God. The Word of God. It says, Honour the Lord with your wealth. With what? With your first fruits. Of all your crops. Of course, now we're not agriculture, right? With our, you can replace that word with your pay, with your business, profits, whatever. Verse 10. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing. This is a promise of God. And your vets will brim over with new wine. And you can find this same uh, blessing in Malachi chapter 3. Amen. Amen. May your finances be blessed as you give your first fruit and your tithe to the Lord. Amen. We want to break that fear of lack today in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And we don't want to rob God. Amen. You know, just three weeks ago before Chinese New Year, 
My husband and I, we went to a shopping centre that we regularly go to to buy supplies, NTUC and all that. And I thought, you know, I should get a new dress for Chinese New Year. I thought, yeah, okay, I'll buy a new dress or new blouse for Chinese New Year because I haven't bought for a few years. So I told my husband, dear, uh, can you buy me a dress? And he said, okay, okay, I'll buy you a dress. And so we were very happy. So we walked into a store, right, to try out some CNY dresses. So I tried on a few and I saw one blouse, one blouse that I like very much. And I said, hey dear, you buy this one for me, okay? But you know what? The lady boss whispered to me because there were other customers in her shop. Hey, let me give you the blouse and the dress you tried on earlier as a gift. God bless my business, so I bless you. Lah. Happy New Year, how Pastor said. Well, you know, I was so surprised. I was so touched by her generosity. But also, by how God was so generous to me because God used her to bless me. Ma. God must have spoken to her. I mean, it's not even a need. It's a want. Right? I can do without. I can wear last year's clothes. No, no problem. Right? It's not a need. It's a want. But God honoured that. God gave me what I wanted. Even though His promise is God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Needs. He doesn't have to bless me with this dress and this blouse. But God was pleased when I exercised faith to give him our first fruit. And today I'm wearing the dress. Nice or not? <laughs> okay, I thought I'll wear it. <laughs> and the first day, second day, I wore the other blouse, right? So, so God supplied. You know, friends, you don't have to worry about finances if you obey God in your giving. If you give your first fruits, if you return your tithe, you don't have to worry about money. God will supply every need that you have. And, and this dress is a sign of His generosity towards me. It's beyond a need. It's just a want. God is good. You will never have to beg on the streets. That's what the Bible says. Your children will never have to beg on the streets when you are generous towards God. That's what the Bible says in the book of Psalms. You will always have an overflow. And I declare it over your life right now. That you, you can have faith in God in your finances, as you sow your first fruit. You know, God it owns a cattle on a thousand hill. That's what the Bible says. No, all He wants is your obedience and your faith in giving. It's like, wow, so, yeah, my precious daughter, my precious son. So obedient. Okay, la. Uh, here's a few goba. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying that. I'm not a prosperity preacher. But you get the idea. You get the idea. God has owns everything and all he wants is our heart. And he wants first what? The first character is finances because he knows that where you sow is where your heart is. So at the end of the day, what God wants is our heart. It's our heart. Not so much our finances because he owns everything. So the first type of faith that pleases God is faith that trusts God for your finances. And by the way, some people say, hey, tithe, how come I'm still so poor? Because that's another sermon. All right, because you need two things to prosper in God, like two legs. You need to tithe, give to God, your first fruit, your tithe. But you also need stewardship. If you spend everything, you have no control. You spend everything uh, that you earn, you will never have enough. So it's two legs to make your finances work. One is you tithe to God. The other one is you are a good steward. That means you live within your means, you save, you invest. If you have this too, you're careful with your finances, you will prosper. That's another sermon on the other leg, all right? So today, I just talk of this because that's what Scripture says. I'm just preaching from the Word of God. Amen? The second type of faith that pleases God is what? Faith that walks close with God. Let's go to the second character. Hebrews chapter, five verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 5. So we're going down sequentially. Verse 5. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. Ah, here's a second guy who pleased God. First guy was Abel. Second guy, Enoch. He pleased God. Second character in the hall of faith is Enoch. He was known as a person who pleased God, as Scripture has said. Okay, what did he do to please God? We want to learn, right? So let's take a look. We have to go back to Genesis to find out the story in, in fuller terms. So Genesis chapter 5, verse 21 to 24 says this, 
When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God. He walked, huh? Then he was no more because God took him away. So Enoch lived in close fellowship. After you read this, you realize that he lived in close fellowship with God for 300 years. And that pleased God very much. Do you know fellowship with him pleases God? He loves to fellowship with each and every one of us. If you spend time with him, he's pleased. As simple as that. The father loves to spend time with his children. And when the Bible says someone walks with God, what does it mean? It means that they have close fellowship with God. For example, uh, Adam walked with God. What does it mean? He walked with God in the garden, which means that he had close fellowship with God. All right, so it, it's a Hebrew thinking that you walk with someone means you fellowship with someone. Okay, it's a figure of speech. And the Bible says that he only walked close to God for, from the age of 65. You realize that? It's very clear. Before that, he not walked with, with the world. He wasn't walking with God for the first 64 years or 60 years or whatever of his life. And I want to bring this application point to you. If you are an older adult, if you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, it's not too late to walk close with God. Maybe you're in your 40s as well, second half already. Spend your latter years knowing God and serving Him like Enoch did. Invest your time, your energy in the kingdom of God. And that's the most glorious way to spend your silver years. Can somebody say amen? If you've walked with the, year, uh, with the, with the world for many, many years of your life, choose today to walk close with God like Enoch did. And I tell you why. He was blessed. He was blessed. So God so enjoyed the fellowship with Enoch that one day, when they were walking in the garden, God says, hey, I enjoy your company so much. Why don't you just come with me to heaven? I don't want to come look for you anymore you know, on earth. You come with me. And he was taken to be with God forever. And that's why the Bible says he was no more. He walked, 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 and he was no more. Because God had taken him to heaven to be with him forever. In fact, the whole, in the whole history of mankind, there were only two people, do you know that? That never died on earth because God took them. The first was Enoch. And who's the second? You know your Bible? Very good, Elijah. Elijah was taken up to heaven in the chariot of fire, isn't it? He never died. So there were only these two guys. And I could imagine God saying, I enjoy your company so much. Please be with me 24-7. I'm taking you with me now. And is it, here's an interesting fact. In Revelation 21 verse 3, let's take a look at that. I heard a loud shout from the throne. All right, this is John the Revelator saying this. Look, God's home is now among His people. He will live with them and they will be His people. God Himself will be with them. This is the end, at the end. Revelations 21. See, God took Enoch to go to heaven. But there will come a day when the opposite will happen. God will create a new heaven and a new earth. And He will come and live among us. There will be no more separation between God and his people. He will live among us forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And that's a wonderful thing that I discovered in the Bible. He, he will be with all of us that day, not just Enoch, but all of us. And then we will move on in verse 6, line by line. Verse 6 is such a popular verse that people take it and put it in the different contexts of whatever you need. We always quote this. Am I correct? But the original context of this verse was to, supposed to be applied to Enoch. Let's read it, verse 6. And it is impossible to please God without faith. We always quote that. It's impossible to, be, you know, to, 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 to please God without faith. Anyone who comes 
to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Amen? Amen? I mean, we just memorize this verse. We, we know it like, you know, just, just spoken like that. We know it. And, you know, how did, how did Enoch please God? How did Enoch please God? He sought God sincerely, earnestly, and passionately. And God says this kind of faith pleases him. I want you to know that Enoch fellowship with an invisible God. God didn't come in human form to walk with him in the garden. God was spirit. And so he fellowship with the spirit of God. He couldn't see God. So first, he must believe that God exists. That's why verse 6 says that. First, he must believe that God exists. And then he sincerely sought God. That's what verse 6 means. It applies to Enoch. And this kind of faith not only pleases God, it also brings a reward. That's what the Bible says. And one reward I believe Enoch received was the blessing of long life of his descendants. That's what I believe. Why? Because the very same verses that I read to you, for Methuselah, his son, was the longest living person on earth. Do you know that? He lived a total of 969 years. How many of you want to live that long? He's the longest living fella uh, on this earth. Yes, so his son lived a long life. And the other reward was Noah, his great-grandson. The great-grandson of Enoch is Noah. Noah. And so Noah was the only one and his family that was saved from the flood. God's protection was upon Noah. He was the great-grandson of Enoch. And if you want to extrapolate a little bit further down the road, many generations down, from Enoch came forth Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. When you walk close to God, I believe the Lord rewards you. And God has a, has, he has a huge impact on your future generation. Can somebody say amen? And so here's an application point. Fathers and mothers, grandfathers and grandmothers, walk close to Jesus. Walk close to Jesus like Enoch did. It has tremendous impact on your children and your children's children. Amen? Amen. Can I hear? Yeah, I believe it, man. Whatever you do, when you walk close to God, it has tremendous impact on your future generations. And can I say this also? Every time you earnestly seek God, God will reward you. When you do your time alone with God, when no one is watching, in a wee early of the morning hour, you spend that time with God. You wake up early and say, God, I'm giving you a sacrifice of praise. I'm coming before your presence. When you pray earnestly to God in your prayer closet when nobody is watching, when you shut in with God and worship Him, friends, He rewards you. That's what Scripture says. How does He reward you? Let me share with you something personal, I feel. Every time I earnestly seek God, I receive three rewards without fail. Number one, I receive His presence. James 4, 8, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Every time I come into the presence of God, I sense His presence and He speaks to me. And that's the most precious thing that I can experience. The assurance of His presence comforts and strengthens me. That's the first P. The second P is peace. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You know, every time I feel troubled, every time I feel, you know, a bit up and down in my spirit, I will run to God to seek Him earnestly. And so often He would give me that supernatural peace that lifts the burden in my spirit. How many of you know what I'm talking about when you run to the presence? His, yeah. He will give you the peace. Number three, I like this one. Prayer answered, the third P. John 16, 24. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. To me, the most exciting thing is when God answers my prayers. Do you know it's more effective to pray and let God do the job for you than to strive and make things happen on your own? Yeah, you agree with that? 
Prayer is the most powerful work I can do. These are the rewards that He gives me when I spend time with Him. Are you enticed to spend time with God now? Does it encourage you? It wakes me up in the morning to spend time with God because there is a reward to be with Him as we seek Him earnestly. Seek Him earnestly. Let Risenites be God chasers. Amen? Let Risenites pursue God with all our hearts, our mind, our soul, our strength, everything that we have. And we know that we will be rewarded. Hallelujah. Amen? So let's, let's recap. So the first type of faith that pleases God is the faith that trusts God for your finances. The second type of faith that pleases God is faith that walks close with God. And the third type of faith that pleases God is faith that leads a righteous life. Faith that leads a righteous life. And so we read down uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. It says this, It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. You see, Noah believed God's word that God would destroy the world by water when the rest of the world didn't believe that. All right, he was the only guy that believed it because God spoke to him, he believed the word of God. And then he obeyed God to build an ark, isn't it? We know the story, Noah's ark, to save his family and also we know the animals as well when the rest of the world laughed at him. So, God considers that faith, faith that pleased him. You see, Noah stood his ground to obey God's command when the rest of the world was living a godless life. He chose to be different from the rest of the world. He chose to obey God. He chose to live faithfully uh, you know, to God. He, he chose to walk with God in holiness when everyone around him was living in sin. You see, when Noah believed God, righteousness was imputed in him. And how do we know this? Let's look at Romans chapter 4, verse 3. What does Bible, what the scripture says? Abraham believed. Everyone say believed. It's important. Believe God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. When you believe God, God says you're righteous. That's it. It's imputed into you. So when Noah believed God, he was considered righteous before God. But not only that, Noah not only believed God with an inward righteousness, he lived an outward righteousness as well. He lived a holy life that pleased God the Father. He lived different than all the rest of the world that was living in evil and complete corruption. He chose to live to please God. And the Bible says, in Genesis 6, we're not, we didn't put it up, but at that time, every thought of man was evil. Every thought. And so that's why God wanted to destroy, destroy the world and restart again with Noah and his three sons. He was in that kind of an environment. And so, even with that pressure that came externally from his community, he still chose to live a life that please God. And how do we know that he was righteous? Let's take a look at Genesis 6 and verse 9. It says this. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man. Clearly stated, it's a righteous man. Blameless among the people of his time. And he walked faithfully with God. That's Noah. And we need to be like Noah. If you live that kind of life like Noah did, God calls that faith and he's pleased with that kind of faith. And so Kotzer says this, Decisions become easier when your will to please God outweighs your will to please the world. That means when you've made up your mind to please God, it's easier to make all the decisions in this life. Can somebody say amen? Noah was such a man because he made up his mind to please God instead of pleasing God the world. And then we read on in that passage, it says, by his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world. 
Now, I don't think Noah preached a sermon all the time to condemn the people. I don't think he stood at the pulpit and then condemned the people. I don't think he did that. Instead, I believe he condemned the world in that sense by his godly conduct without any preaching at all. Amen? It was his godly conduct. Because he lived so holy that in that sense, people felt very condemned because oh, he's so holy and they felt condemned. So the question to us is, do we live righteously before God or do we live like the people of the days of Noah? You see, the devil has very e easy access to our lives these days to tempt us to sin. We don't have to live in Sodom and Gomorrah to sin against God. We don't have to live in Sin City to sin against God. Sin can come right into our home these days through things called the handphone, the tablets, the TV that is connected to the internet. The programs that we watch, the stuff that we read on the internet, the things we scroll through on FB, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, the violence and vulgarity that we watch on Netflix. Are we careful with what we allow to come into our minds? Are we pleasing to the Holy Spirit who lives within us by what we put into our minds or what we subject ourselves to? Do we allow all these things and junk to come into our lives and defile the temple of the Holy Spirit? Friends, we need to watch what comes through our eye gate and our ear gate to make sure that it's clean so that we do not defile the temple of the Holy Spirit where God resides within us. And it's so easy to allow that if we're just not careful for a moment. Can somebody say amen? So how do you get faith? The question is, so how do you get faith? Romans 10, 17 says this, for faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of God. Very simple. You want faith, you got to hear the Word of God. We have to hear the Word of God consistently in order to grow in our faith. Which means to say daily Bible reading is a must if you want to grow in your faith. You've got to read the Bible. You've got to hear the Word of God every day. Amen. That's the way that you can grow in your faith. How much time do you spend on TikTok? Or whatever it is, social media, FB. How much time do you spend in the Word? If we can only reverse that order, our life will change, isn't it? It's, uh, all the time you spend on social media, you spend it on the Word, you will be full of faith. And God will be pleased with that. I'm not condemning all these social media things, but I'm telling you, let's us be careful how we steward our time in these things and be careful what we watch. So what is the thrust of this sermon? I was asking God, so what is the main point that you want us to take note of? And I felt him saying this. It is to exercise faith. It is to exercise faith. Let's not be distracted by that. It always comes at a time when I'm giving my main point. You realize that? So we silence the work of the enemy in Jesus' name. That this place is dedicated to the Lord Jesus alone. So I felt him say, it's to exercise faith. You can't just believe in your mind, but you must put faith in action. So that's the main thrust. If you don't remember anything else that I say, please remember this one point. You need to exercise faith. You can't just hear the word of God day in and day out and do nothing. You must put your faith to action. James chapter 2, verse 17 says this. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. So faith without action is dead. Faith must be followed by action in order to please God. Abel had to practice his faith by actually giving his first fruit. He just, he, he just didn't think about it. He actually did it. Enoch had to practice his faith by spending time with God every day. He just, just didn't just think about it. He actually did it. Noah had to practice his faith 
by obeying God to build the ark, right? And living righteously among people who were unrighteously, unrighteous. So he had to actually do it. And when they practiced what they believed, God was pleased with their faith. Amen? That's a thrust. Faith with works together is what pleases God. I would like to invite the musicians to come back. All right now, let's, let's prepare to our hearts. And I'd like to close with this illustration. There was once a man who rowed people across the river. He's a boatsman. So he had two oars, right? Left and right oar. So on one oar, he carved the word faith. Faith on the oar. And on the other oar, he carved the word works. So one day he was rowing. He's rowing the boat, right? Then one of the passengers noticed the carvings and asked him, hey, you know, what, what is this faith and works about? So this man didn't reply, but he pulled in the oar that was marked works. And he started to roll with only one oar that was marked faith. And guess what? The boat went round in circles, didn't it? Then he pulled in the oar that marked faith and started to roll with only the other one marked works. And the boat again went round in circles. But this time it was the opposite direction. He then rowed the boat both oars. Good exercise. And he reached the other bank safely. Before his passengers got off the boat, he told them, a Christian must row his life using both oars, faith and works. Only then will he reach heaven's shore. Amen. Friends, what has God been saying to you but you have put off you had faith, but there was no works. It's time to act in faith. It's time to put off procrastination and step out in faith in action. Just to recap, three types of faith that pleases God. Number one, faith that trusts God for your finances. Number two, faith that walks close to God. Number three, faith that leads a righteous life. These kinds of faith pleases God.